In this podcast, we want to examine the concept of Canada West as a unique, distinctive region of Canada. West as a distinct society, if you will, with uh, aspirations and concerns that are unique and that need to be met if the Canada West is to remain an integral part of the Canadian Confederation and uh, to be contented with its position there. And we want to come at this in part through telling some of the stories that are connected with the, with the Canada West, not just historic stories, but contemporary ones as well, and perhaps even look at the future, what the Canada West story is going to be in the future. So and when I talk about Canada West, we're really talking about everything west of the Ontario uh, Manitoba border. Oh, but there might be a debate as to what parts of what, whether the Pacific coast is actually part of Canada West or not. But roughly, that's what we're talking about when we say Canada West. So uh, I'm joined today by uh, Marco uh, Navarro Jenny, who's spent a lot of time with think tanks and advocacy groups and uh, dealing with some of the issues we want to talk about. And uh, uh, Mark, I wonder if we could start by you just saying, what is it about Canada West that is distinctive? What are some of those distinctive features? Um, yes, the, um, the definition of something is always the tricky part, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think you started by mentioning geography, so maybe we'll, uh, we'll start there. Um, arguably, uh, Canada uh, West starts at the Ontario uh, Manitoba border. Uh, I some people might quarrel that you know Kenora might, might be more like us yeah. than 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 Torontonians, for example, uh, and then sweeping west uh, uh, all the way to uh, past the the, the Rockies. Uh, some people today still argue that the Pacific region is a region unto itself. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Um, and uh, and the reality is that uh, if that is true, we're really talking about the coastal region uh, of uh, British Columbia, considering that uh, the uh, the inland of British Columbia is a lot more like us than uh, than than it is different. Uh, one of the things that I've always uh, remarked about uh, these type of uh, definitions and, and identities is that. In Canada, we tend to see and draw these uh, likeness and comparisons between the East and the West. Mm -hmm. um, but when you think about the coast of British Columbia, they're a lot more like the Americans on the Pacific coast. Yes, yeah. um, they have more in common with them that, than, than they do with us, for example. And, and one might say that we have more in common with, say, folks in Montana or in Idaho. Uh, so there is that sort of east-west axis, but that said, there's a border there that we cannot ignore. Uh, and this geographic, I mean, the, the prairies are a unique part of Canada. There's no equivalent to the Canadian prairies in Ontario, Quebec, or Atlantic Canada. The uh, the Rocky Mountains; they, these are distinct features of this yes, kind of, kind of geographically, geographically. So, so that's geologically, I guess. And geologically too. That's so. That's the geography. Uh, the reality then expands from there. Uh, regions are, at the beginning, uh, geographical, but they are also a state of mind. They encompass culture, politics, economics, and, and all these things. And, uh, and what is unique about the West is a certain state of mind, uh, a certain way of being um, that is largely rural. And even today, when uh, the region is a lot more urban urbanized than the rest of uh uh, or than, than what it used to be, uh, the reality is that even urban people in the West, people in Regina, people in Winnipeg, people in Calgary or in Edmonton, still identify a great deal uh, with the uh, lifestyle, if uh, to put it yeah, that way. With resource sectors as the fundamental building block of the economy. Yes. Uh, another aspect of the region, of course, is that is in many ways newer politically speaking, than the, than the rest of the country. I have met people in, uh, uh, in uh, this part of the world whose grandparents uh, arrived here uh, from somewhere else and lived in sod huts, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, in the early part of the, uh, of the 20th century. So there is that spirit of pioneering that is still very much alive 
uh, in uh, in the Canadian and West. It's a value to freedom. A lot of people came to the West to get free from something. In some cases, dictatorial regimes. In some cases, just the shackles of tradition. Uh, that freedom ethic seems to be a pretty big part of the Western political culture. And that's distinct from, say, uh, Eastern and Laurentian Canada. Uh, a good deal of the people who first settled there uh, were not really running from anything. They had come to conquer. Uh, they had come to plant a flag, yeah, yeah, yeah. Plant a flag on behalf of uh, their monarch. Uh, and that's quite distinct. They were, in a sense, um, pseudo-agents of the state, uh, whereas the people who settled the West uh, were either running from something uh, or looking to build something new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so, I mean, so we can make the case, we could go on and on, and the West is distinct uh, geographically, uh, geologically, uh, culturally. Uh, uh, maybe we can zero in on, uh, this is more political, on, on the West is constitutionally distinct. And uh, this gets into a bit of the storytelling that, uh, as you recall, uh, at one time the West was one big territory, the old Northwest uh, territory that encompassed all this region that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think it even went into eastern, uh, northern Ontario. And uh, the last great premier of that territory was this F.W.G. Hall Tane. And there's this famous story of, of course, at the turn of the century, the Liberal government under Laurier decided to carve the West up into smaller units. And, and there's people that suspect the reason this was done that didn't want one big region to counterbalance Quebec and Ontario wanted to divide it up. And Laurier's proposal was to expand the province of Manitoba that had been created and uh, create the new province of Saskatchewan, the province of Alberta, the Northwest Territory and the Yukon Territory. And uh, Hall Payne uh, objected to that. And there was this debate held in, uh, it was December 18, 1901 in Indian Head, Saskatchewan. And uh, uh, it was a debate between Rodman Robbins, who was then the Premier of Manitoba when it was the little postage stamp province, and Hall Tain. And Rodman took the federal position that it was okay to carve the West up. Of course, he was going to be Premier of his province, so he maybe had a vested interest in that position. And Hall Tain took the other position that uh, the West should remain as one big province. He wanted to call it Buffalo, uh, to counter, uh, uh, to, to have equal weight with Ontario and Quebec in the, uh, in the Federation. And he labeled the people that wanted to carve up the West little Westerners. And he characterized he, himself and his group as the big Westerners. His question was, are you a little Westerner? Are you a big Westerner? Apparently he won that debate. Uh, and, and, you know, in those days, they, they had 1,500, 1,800 people came to this meeting in the winter by sled and by horseback. It was a big deal. He won the debate, but he lost the battle. Laurier's view prevailed. But, uh, and the, uh, where, where this ties into the meetings of the West, so the, the, those new Western provinces were created, but they were constitutionally and legally inferior to the older provinces. They were denied control of their natural resources. So the West was kind of born unequal constitutionally. And that, that's that been a feature and a dimension of Western provinces, how to get legal and constitutional equality with the traditional parts of Canada. That's been a part of the Western aspiration, right, virtually from day one. And it's and still reflected in some of the institutions uh, of the country, the way that uh, it has been carved up. If you think about the Senate, for example, um, we've had this uh, desire to have a, a, an equal uh, and effective Senate for a long time. Uh, the uh, the reality that, for example, a, a province like Nova Scotia or uh, New Brunswick, uh, who are represented at the tune of 10 people in the Senate uh, instead of uh, uh, six for Alberta or Saskatchewan or, or, or BC, uh, these are the sorts of things that uh, that signal that kind of uh, inequality. Uh, I remember um, um, I started uh, studying political science at, at McGill, and uh, and I had uh, J. R. Mallory was one of my professors, okay. uh, sort of a, a legend in, in in political science in Canada, and uh, and Mallory referred uh, to to the West uh, as a place that had been. 
uh, conquered and colonized. Uh, and uh, he spoke about the West uh, in terms of uh, Roman provinces. Uh, and, and, and what he meant, really, was that uh, there were provinces in the legal sense of the term, uh, but that they were not equal to Rome. And therefore, uh, they could be uh, places where resources were extracted, where the, the wealth was redirected uh, towards the center. And uh, that seemed uh, quite apt as an image um, in relation to what some uh, people in the West see themselves as in its relationship to Ottawa. We'll probably come back to this in future podcasts, but this constitutional legal inequality of the West and the aspiration to be more equal is a constant theme and and, uh, it's a subject to debate. How do you gain constitutional legal equality when you don't feel that you're there? I guess the second thing we could touch on in terms of distinctiveness is the political distinctiveness, that the West has this tradition of, of its political innovation, of generating new political parties outside the traditional party structure. And like it, it originally, well, in the turn of the century, there was the old Progressive Party, which was basically an agricultural party, mm-hmm. and then that gave birth to the, uh, the uh, Farmers' Parties, United Farmers of Alberta, United Farmers of Manitoba, United Farmers of Ontario formed a government there uh, briefly, uh, and these, these were political parties outside the traditional liberals and conservatives, and then the Depression produced two more parties, the, the CCF, which ultimately became the NDP, the, uh, the social credit that formed governments in Alberta and, uh, and BC, and then my, my own experience in the late 80s, the Reform, Reform. Party, which uh, then gave birth to the Canadian Alliance, which uh, then gave birth to the current uh, Conservative Party of Canada. So it, it isn't that, that a, that's a distinctive. The West tends to innovate politically through the creation of third parties as a, something quite unique. Uh, certainly, uh, is, I think, dovetails with a certain kind of spiritedness uh, in the West in a, cert- in a sense of entrepreneurial uh, politics that uh, that that we that we see uh, certainly uh, in terms of uh, the creation of political parties um, is is one of the things that uh, I, I used to be fond of saying that is is one of the things that the West produces uh, the most in addition to wheat and cattle and many of these things uh, in, in in addition to the natural resources uh, we tend to produce political parties and often these political parties. Um, Harking back to the to the to the previous uh, theme, uh, come uh, out of a sense of uh, wanting to be um, wanting to occupy a certain constitutional space, wanting to have uh, unlimited uh, um, unlimited abilities uh, to grow. Uh, if you think about, for example, uh, the kinds of constraints that the constitution imposed. Um, so there's a desire for equality, but the desire for equality is out of a sense that something is being imposed on the region yeah, that the yeah, region yeah, wants yeah. wants to break out of. Many and, of them have had a protest to mention too. But you mentioned to me earlier, was it on the phone that the, the other region of Canada that does invent uh, third parties is and uh, you, you studied in, in Quebec. Quebec is a history of producing third parties too. Uh, there is a great deal of parallels uh, between Quebec and uh, and the West, and sometimes between uh, Quebec and Alberta, but in particular, uh, and and this is one of them. Uh, this this uh, production of new political parties and uh, a, a kind of reluctance to accommodate uh, the tight uh, duality or bipartisanship uh, that uh, that the country was initially framed uh, from, and uh, I'm sure you have you, you've come across. Um, the uh, the correspondence between uh, René Lévesque uh, and Peter Lougheed prior to the uh, oh, yeah. prior yeah. to the patriation of the constitution, and uh, it is amazing to see uh, the commonalities and the nearly brotherhood that there is between well, well, the two I of have them. A story on that: when the charter was being put together, uh, my father and I took a look at some of the early documents of it and noticed that there was no protection of. Uh, property rights. There was no property right protection in Pierre Trudeau's original draft. So we, we put the project together to draft a, a property rights protection section to be included in the uh, 
in the charter. And then we went around to, at that stage, we knew a fair number of the premiers to see if we could get some provincial government to carry this into the discussion that ultimately led to the, to the, uh, the ch charter. And ironically, we, we couldn't persuade any of them, including our conservative friends, to do this. I, I had a session with Rafe Mayer, who was the constitutional minister in BC, and I showed Rafe this thing and said, we've got to get this into the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And Rafe said, that, that, that this would make it hard to expropriate stuff. <laughs> 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 that right. didn't mean you couldn't expropriate, but this clause said if you expropriate, you had to pay fair. It was, nor should private property be taken except by due process of law and upon payment of just compensation, very similar to the American provision. We couldn't get anywhere, uh, including with Peter Lloyd, because Peter felt it was a criticism of his Alberta Bill of Rights, which didn't have a property rights protection clause, and we couldn't get around that. Anyway, for some reason, I went to Quebec City. Uh, you, like at that time, we had a, a socialist separatist government, but the we knew the energy minister there was Guy Giraud, so I went mm -hmm. to see him. And, we had this discussion. It, it, it was a blizzard that day. It ended up getting stuck with them in the legislative building in Quebec City for longer than what my appointment was. And we got kicking this around. And then I, I don't remember now whether he said it or I said it or how it came about. He said, you know, if you expanded the definition of property to include property held by the crown in the right of the provinces, wouldn't the entrenching that clause protect provincial resources from expropriation by the federal government? Which is not a bad idea. It's, it, that, that is a really <laughs> thing. I still have a file on this this attempt because it was not successful. We couldn't get the economic protection clause into the the charter. But the, the most favorable letter I have in this file from the administrations is from a, a socialist separatist premier <laughs> or office in Quebec arguing something quite similar to what the West was uh, or what we felt the West should be advocating on the subject of property rights. And we still don't have no, uh, full no, protection no. of property rights that, in Canada. That, that's, uh, uh, but, but coming back to this political distinctiveness, I, I guess another distinctiveness, uh, these, uh, well maybe going back to what we said before, this attempt to get constitutional equality, the, the one success that the West had in that regard, and it was engineered by these third parties, was to get the, the constitutional amendment that, re, that gave the control of natural resources to the provinces back from the federal government in 1930. And, and the way that came about was uh, these parties played a big role in it. It was championed mainly by the United Farmers of Alberta, by Premier Brownlee, mm -hmm. who pushed pushed for this, that the, that the Western provinces should have control of their natural resources, just like Ontario and Quebec and Atlantic Canada. But of course, the, you had to get the federal government to agree to it. And, and in those days, the, you, you had to amend the BNA Act, which was basically a British statute. And uh, But in, in 1930, there was just this fortuitous circumstance in the in the parliament where the Mackenzie King had a minority government and there was a bunch of these old progressives and united farmers in that parliament and they made it their condition on supporting King in his minority position was that he agreed to the natural resources transfer agreement. So the one constitutional amendment that where the West actually had a victory was to get control of its natural resources would not have occurred had it not been for the efforts of these third parties, and particularly the progressives in the UFA that held the balance of power in that 1930 parliament. And, and King, uh, the, the parliament agreed to the measure, and then it went to England, of course England said they were Britain, and they'd do whatever was necessary, and that's how that amendment got into the, the constitution. And ironically, King was defeated two months later, <laughs> but so he just got in by the wire. But those third parties played an enormous role in the one constitutional victory that the, the West ever got. Well, many people argue uh, still today uh, that one of the greatest achievements of the Reform Party uh, was to pin the uh, Croatian liberals uh, to a fiscal agenda uh, that uh, was more about uh, responsibility, uh, protecting the dollar, uh, and uh, paying down debt. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Uh, often the the influence of these uh, smaller uh, Western parties uh, 
has been uh, quite significant uh, for the rest of the country. Well, that was one of the stories. Like when the reform started in 1987, 88, the, the pollsters, and I remember them coming to us and saying, they said, look, support for balancing the federal budget is around 20%. It, it's not enough to really grow crusade because reform is making a huge thing about bad about balancing the budget. Well, rather than accepting that, say, well, I guess we shouldn't crusade on that because there's not much support for us. And we're going to change that. And a whole bunch of other people said that. The Taxpayers Federation wasn't just us. And uh, after a five-year campaign, though, by 1993, when there was a federal election, which reform got its breakthrough, by then, budget balancing, as a result of political activity and a lot of other activity, was up to 50%. And one of the stories, and I don't know whether it's true or not, that after the election, the pollsters went in to see Gretchen. They paid a lot of attention to the pollsters and said that these idiots got two and a half million votes crusading on this budget balancing and a few other things. And Gretchen, of course, was a total pragmatist. Gretchen, Gretchen, and I had sessions with Sean Gretchen. Anyway, so the story was Gretchen said, let's balance the budget. <laughs> we, and just like that, yeah, just like that. And and he always argued that he he was the driving force behind but b- balancing the budget, not Martin. He, he quite incensed that Martin got credit for it. But uh, well, that that's another illustration of these third parties that the West generates um, having some influence, not not just regionally, but uh, but nationally. But but still talking about those third parties, and this is another distinctive of the West. To be interested to get your thoughts on almost all of these have been these populist parties or they've had mm-hmm. a populist dimension to this bottom up uh, political energy harnessed to some political objective uh, uh, medicare in the case of the ccf uh, monetary reform in the case of social credit uh, budget balance in the case of reform uh, and isn't that a distinctive feature that that populist dimension to political parties is a part of the western political culture that you don't find at least as strongly in the other parts of the country? I, I think where you might also find it is in, also in Quebec. In Quebec, yeah. uh, And so, oddly enough, um, Quebec's, Quebec's politics tend to be quite, quite a bit populist uh, uh, as well, uh, not in the rest of the country. And uh, I, I think there is an element of republicanism uh, in, in Quebec that has always been uh, quite strong. And, uh, and in the West, uh, we are less deferent uh, towards towards authority. We're more we're more egalitarian, uh, and so the uh, the uh, uh, peace, order, and good government deference to authority bastion in the country really is is Ontario, uh, and a little bit of the Maritimes. Uh, so this element uh, of uh, harnessing the the power of the popular uh, sentiment uh, into political movements. Uh, is indeed quite a bit of uh, uh, a distinct feature of, uh, of Western Canada. And, and aren't there some positive lessons too? Like a, a lot of the discussion of populism these days is, uh, particularly by the more elite commentators, is, is extremely negative. It's seen as a uh, wild force, an uncontrollable force, and a, a bunch of ignorant people uh, exerting themselves politically. But, but the West experience has been that uh, I mean, there is a wild, there can be a wild dimension to populism, but the West experience is that you can harness that populist energy to some very constructive uh, achievements, like the, uh, well, the, the first woman elected mm-hmm. to the federal mm-hmm. parliament, Agnes Campbell, but failed, did not come through the liberals, because she came uh, as a progressive. In fact, the liberals, the liberals particularly did everything possible to try to defeat her. I often find this ironic with liberals championing women's rights today. They did everything possible. And eventually they did. Eventually they did. She was beaten eventually by a, a liberal candidate. And the, the Alberta famous five that mm-hmm. got women recognized as persons in Canadian law, now, all, four of those five were all mixed up in populist movements. The Farmers Party, several of them got elected to the Alberta legislature as populist politicians. So uh, I, I've used this analogy from the... Uh, the oil patch that, you know, in the oil patch there's such a thing as a wildcat well where you drill into an area where you don't know what's down below. And then there can be such a thing as a road well where you hit the pocket of oil or gas under enormous pressure. And it can be very dangerous. It can blow the, uh, the drilling platform no, off no. the well. It can catch fire. It, it, uh, I think it was called Atlantic Number no. 3 in 1948 outside of Edmonton was a, a road well that just 
it was enormous uh, disaster, caught fire and everything else. But uh, the way you deal with a rogue well, though, is, uh, I don't know if that's true today, I know it was in the old days, was you, you can drill in a relief well from the side, and the angle has to be exactly right. If it's too shallow, it won't take off enough pressure. If it's too deep, it can turn into it. Another rogue well. But yeah. if it's just right, it can take off enough pressure, and you can then bring the well under control, install valves, and, and harness that enormous energy to something good. And I, I used to think of the Reform Party as a, kind of that relief well. In the 1980s, there was quite a separatist sentiment building up in, in Western Canada. The separatist parties elected the members of the Alberta legislature. And uh, th there was a lot of anger over the West position as a result of a number of things done by both the federal conservatives and the federal liberals. And, and reform was the relief well. We, we, you have to identify with what's causing the angst. You have to plug into the into the, the, the source of the energy, but that then we, but there's another way of handling this other than secession. Can't we reform the Senate? Can't we balance the budget? Can't we get more equity? And uh, I think there's a lesson that these populist forces, energies, which are around today, can be harnessed to constructive uh, uh, objectives, but it, it requires a certain kind of leadership and it requires recognizing that that's the way you deal with populism. You, you try and just clap that well down and you might very well just blow it up. Yes, I, I, I think uh, an, another uh, example, uh, jumping back to, to uh, the comparisons we, with Quebec uh, earlier, uh, of the positive aspects of populism uh, would be the Parti Québécois under uh, René Lévesque. Um, Quebec was a powder keg uh, at a time when there was a, a certain amount of um, a desire uh, to um, uh, to declare unilateral uh, independence. Oh, yeah, uh, there yeah. was a terrorist a terrorist group that wanted uh, that wanted to declare war oh, yeah, on the on the, the country. FLQ, the FLQ, FLQ yeah. uh, and uh, and René Lévesque uh, essentially steered uh, the energy of uh, uh, the, the Quebec identity towards a more constructive and more democratic aspect uh, yeah, he, of he, politics. Uh, Bouchard's adding the sovereignty association, which is this. A very, it's not quite separatism, it's, uh, yes, it's sovereignty, but... It's, it's a halfway house. <laughs> yes, it's very Canadian. Why the Canadian cross the road to get to the middle? That applies to, <laughs> to Quebec. But, uh, so we've really touched on, these are some of the distinctive features of, uh, of Western Canada. There's more of these. We can elaborate on these in further podcasts, but we've talked about the constitutional distinct or the geographic and geological distinctiveness, the cultural distinctiveness, the uh, constitutional distinctiveness, and the uh, and the political distinctiveness, which uh, is quite a list of distinctness. One one of, one of the things that uh, uh, strikes me as I hear you say the word distinct is that uh, almost in the same way that uh, people have this negative connotation of uh, populism. Uh, there is a certain angle from which people look at the argument of distinctiveness as a way to say that one is better or superior than than the rest. Yeah. And and that's that's not at all the case, at least in the Western form of distinctiveness. Um, w Western Canadians uh, see themselves as equal uh, to one another and to the and to the rest of the country. Uh, there is no sense of uh, superiority. Uh, there is no sense of greatness in, compared, in comparison to the rest of the country. There is a certain demand that uh, the West be given its place, but it's not out of a desire of superiority. It's actually out of the, uh, an egalitarian desire. Yeah, a desire for equality, yeah. not, not superiority. Yeah. Let, let's jump forward now to, we've talked about the West distinctiveness, but let's talk about some of the current distinctive aspirations of Western Canada. And I, I use the word aspirations. I used to give a lot of speeches on Western alienation, which dwelt on the West's concerns. Um, my worry about that, and it's been pointed out to me by others, is that that's essentially negative. And if you harp away on it long enough, it almost comes across as whining. And uh, there's a better way, and it's probably a more accurate way to talk about the West's aspirations. The West aspires to certain things that are beneficial to the West, but be beneficial to the country as a whole. So it may be better to list these uh, Western aspirations and maybe deal with them. And I'll maybe list some of them off, and then we'll come back to each one, or you, you might want to add to them. Okay, sounds good. Uh, one of them is the, the West aspires to uh, see the natural resource sectors 
the agriculture, energy, mining, forestry, and fisheries recognized as fundamental building blocks of the economy, not as some kind of relic from the past or, 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 or something that's, uh, that's been bypassed by future economic development. So there's that, uh, the whole natural resources uh, sector and how, how it's treated and recognized. There's this need for unobstructed transportation corridors through the Atlantic and Pacific and the, and the Arctic, uh, which is particularly important to landlocked provinces like Saskatchewan and uh, Alberta. There's this Western desire that goes way back, and I've got a story about this, uh, domestic free trade. The West's always been strong on free trade, not just internationally, but domestic mm -hmm. free trade. And, uh, there'd be benefits in that. The West aspires to greater freedom of trade within the country. And there's the, uh, the, the, this desire for equality in the federal provincial fiscal relations, particularly their equalization, uh, has been a, a concept that has not worked to the advantage, particularly of the province of Alberta. So th these are some of the current aspirations. So maybe we can start on those and, and maybe talk a little bit about this aspiration to see the natural resources sectors regarded as fundamental building blocks of the economy, not as some kind of relic from the past that we're apologizing for or trying to get beyond. Uh, because they're not. Uh, well, the, the, re the reality is that uh, we haven't caught up uh, in the public perception with the reality of what it takes uh, to engage uh, the whether it's the exploration or the harvesting of uh, many of these natural resources. Um, nowadays, uh, it takes more than a chainsaw to be into, into the lumber business. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, you know, it takes more than just a couple of cows to be in the, uh, in the ranching business. The reality is that a significant deal of uh, these areas now engage in high, high technology yeah. uh, to be yeah. able to, oh. to manage uh, and to be able to balance uh, the uh, um, the the economic uh, uh, desires uh, as well as the environmental uh, the the environmental uh, uh, ethics on the on the other side, and the role of technology in these areas is only going to get larger and larger. Uh, nowadays, we have uh, farms that are completely computer run uh, that they have they gather data. Uh, in which uh, is hooked up to a computer, uh, and uh, the computers regulate the exact amount of water yep. that is needed uh, to to irrigate and fertilize, and and all these sorts of things. So uh, the idea that uh, the expo the exploitation of natural resources uh, is is something that Canada used to do in the 17th century, and therefore we must come out of it, uh, it does not really respond uh, to the. Uh, economic and the technological reality of and how we engage. It requires to get a na national government and provincial governments that recognize that and champion that. I mean, there's, there's not a lot of things Canada can lead the world in, but Canada has one of the largest stocks of natural resources of any nation in the world. It comes from having the second largest land area. And why we don't recognize that as a strength and endeavor to exploit it rather than kind of apologize. One of the visuals that I've used. Uh, try to explain this, like there's this old sort of pyramid model of the economy that has the natural resource sectors in the basement, and it has the respective manufacturing sector on the respectable main floor, and it's got the service sector, and it's got the, the knowledge sector in the penthouse. Like, there, there's a lot of very sophisticated people that that's their model of the economy. And what I do is try and take that pyramid and cut it the other way. I say that there's an agricultural production sector, sector at, the, in the, at the base, but there's an agriculture manufacturing sector, which mm -hmm. is huge. This is what you're saying. There's an agricultural service sector. There's an agricultural knowledge and technology sector. But it's built on that base. And that's the same for every one of those, those uh, resource sectors. And uh, High finance uh, it, it's yeah, also included yeah, in that. In, yeah. In, yeah. And if, uh, so that, that's an area that uh, I think there's a lot of work has to be done to try to get that. Uh, recognition of the resource sectors is fundamentally important. Not just the West economy, but the Canada economy is, a, is something to work on. Well, let's look at the second one then, and this is where some of your expertise uh, is very uh, relevant. This need for uh, unobstructed transportation corridors to tide water to the Atlantic, to the Pacific, and the uh, 
and the art, and of course, Canadian history and the history of the West, and the, the creation of transportation corridors played a huge role. And the original search for the Northwest Passage was a search for a way to get to the West from the East. The, the, the what, what is it, Pierre Burton called the National Dream, the yes. building of the, uh, the Canadian Pacific Railway. Uh, the original interprovincial pipeline, the original Trans Canada pipeline, gas pipeline, which was at that time the longest and largest pipeline, gas pipeline in the world. Uh, historically, there's been this constant search for corridors, but what, what, what's the contemporary story there and the, the contemporary need? Well, the, 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 there's different aspects of the contemporary story. Um, I remember reading a paper about 15 years ago um, about a a proposal to uh, to do essentially a, a super highway, an autobahn uh, of of the Trans Canada Highway. Right? Uh, that that would certainly be a, a, a tremendous feat uh, to to organize today uh, in uh, in our country. Uh, but uh, the I think the the one that comes immediately to mind uh, is the obstruction of pipelines and transmission lines. Um, in, in, in the context of uh, transmission lines, um, it, it's Newfoundland, uh, of course, that, that yeah. has been um, essentially tied um, to its island. Uh, um, well, not so much to the, to, to, to the island part, it's the Labrador part that, that is uh, essentially blocked from uh, building. And uh, Quebec refusing to wheel. Labrador and Newfoundland power across its transmission line to American markets. Correct, yeah. uh, and uh, and so uh, that that the name of that province comes up again yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. so, uh, in uh, in the desire to build uh, pipelines uh, across uh, the country. For example, uh, it has been noted uh, and uh, almost uh, with a, a certain amount of, of uh, begrudgment uh, that uh, um, significant portions of uh, the country on the east uh, side. Uh, consume high volumes of foreign oil uh, from from places that are often despicable in terms of uh, labor standards and the treatment of women and and so forth, uh, and uh, but uh, are unable to receive uh, oil produced in Alberta and in Saskatchewan because uh, we don't have a greater capacity, and that was the whole plan uh, of building uh, the Energy East uh, pipeline that was ultimately blocked. Uh, uh, by Quebec. And you have this other contradiction of the banning tanker traffic on the Pacific coast, but not banning tanker traffic coming up the St. Lawrence, if you're going to be consistent. And, and one, one could argue that uh, uh, the, uh, environmentally or ecologically, uh, the Bay of Fundy is a significantly a greater risk uh, if there was a spill, for example, at the Port of St. John. Uh, because of the way that uh, the tides move all the way inland, all the way to near to Truro and through the rivers uh, up to uh, Moncton in, in, in different parts of uh, two different provinces, uh, it, it would be a disaster. Uh, but we manage the risk uh, and tankers come into, into St. John, uh, empty their contents of crude oil to be refined at what is essentially the largest refinery uh, in the uh, in the country, uh, we seem to manage that very well, and yet uh, we are uh, unwilling uh, to have uh, tankers come into the into the west coast so to how, pick up how, Alberta how oil. How do you get these unobstructed trans? Like, like you couldn't build a CPR today. You couldn't build the Trans Canada no. pipeline. You couldn't build any of these. You probably couldn't build the Trans Canada. <laughs> uh, how do we get these? Uh, unobstructed transportation corridors to today. This is an aspiration of Western Canada that is relevant to the entire country, but how do we get there? There are a couple of issues. Uh, one, of course, is that uh, the, the need for environmental standards uh, and uh, environmental standards that uh, have now nearly uh, been wholly deposited in the federal government uh, when the reality is natural resources and the environment are almost um, go hand in hand and should be, by and large, provincial, provincial jurisdiction. And so that's an arrogation of the, uh, of the federal government. Uh, the second issue, of course, is that there are two standards. Uh, we have seen, we, we've seen, we just talked about the, the, the East Coast and the West Coast. Uh, 
uh, there are similar projects, for example, for building um, power plants uh, or, or dams for power plants in that sort of um, mega construction that uh, receive all the checks uh, for, from the federal government uh, right away. And then we have uh, extra developments of the oil sands in Alberta uh, that uh, are essentially drowned uh, in paperwork uh, in order to get approval. Uh, and so uh, there is, I think, at, at, at bottom, a certain type of overreach uh, on the part of the federal government on environmental and standards. And for balance. Like I, I've argued, I, I, I was involved in the, in the 70s in, in arguing that you needed environmental impact assessments of major economic uh, uh, projects, including uh, pipelines. Uh, Alberta's first uh, environmental act was passed, I think, in 1970. Uh, but but the quid pro quo, and I don't I have argued this in more recent years, is we also mm -hmm. need economic impact assessments of major environmental protection measures. W where's the environmental impact assessment of the Canada signing the Paris Accord? W where's the mm -hmm. economic impact assessment of uh, adopting the carbon price re regime? I, I'm not saying there shouldn't be these protective measures, but you need the environmental impacts on the one hand and the, economic impacts on the other, then a government can strike a balance between them. And it seems particularly the current uh, federal government is all on one side of that and we don't have balance. And, and this uh, precludes progress on these, uh, on these interconnections, uh, these unobstructed transportation. Yes, and, and not to complain too much, but now there is another finger on that, on that scale uh, with the desire to have uh, these uh, gender balance uh, assessments. Uh, of uh, mega projects, oh, right? sure. this this yeah. uh, intersectionality, as yeah. as, yeah. The, as yeah. the Feds calls. Well, uh, another uh, thing that I, I put forward on this, still talking about unobstructed transportation corridors, uh, I, I think the federal government should legislate the rights of way. I distinguish between what's in the right of way. It's just you just need the right way. So, you know, I don't know. You know, half mile wide corridor that the, all the federal government do, does is guarantee the right of way. And then, if you want to build a railway, you want to build a pipeline, you have to go and apply to use the right of way. But the the right of way is it can, can be established by federal legislation. That section of the the Constitution, section ninety two uh, ten A and C, actually, that says the federal government can declare something like that to be a work to the advantage of Canada, mm -hmm. which puts it under federal jurisdiction. And it seems to me there's a place to create those right of ways to create these, uh, and you don't have to prejudge then what's in the right of way, but you say there will there will be a corridor to the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Arctic that will be guaranteed by the federal government. And I go so far as to say that make amendments to the criminal code to say if you obstruct something in one of those right of ways that has got regulatory approval, you will be guilty of a criminal offense. Yes, uh, and I think uh, the federal government has a, a similar ability. Uh, perhaps not to the great extent, uh, to open up um, interprovincial uh, trade uh, yeah. across yeah. across borders. Uh, the present reality is that uh, each province uh, claims to have uh, a kind of a, um, embracing, embracing free trade, but the reality is uh, that through a series of regulations and, uh, uh, and rules, uh, there are huge barriers. Um, when I lived in Atlantic Canada, uh, th there are lots of uh, quirky examples. Um, in the four provinces, there are four different standards to regulate uh, the repair of um, elevators, for example. Okay. Do, do you really need four different standards uh, of regulation for elevators? But, but the, the funniest one, and, and, and perhaps uh, the, the, the most grievous one, uh, was that uh, between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, um, people who work uh, in construction and electricity and, and that sort of thing uh, are re were required to have one set of boots to work on one side of the border and a different set of boots because the, the boot requirement uh, and the contents of the first aid kits were completely different. Right? And so clearly that's, that's a, a, a hindrance by design uh, to prevent people from moving uh, back and forth. Um, we, maybe we can come back a, a, a little bit. I can remember where, where we were supposed to talk about. Well, well uh, this is morphing into that. Another one is this aspiration. And I guess you could question the legitimacy of it because the provinces erect 
these barriers, but th th there is this aspiration for uh, for freer trade domestically. And this has a long history in the West. This is sort of a funny story, but uh, someone pointed out to me that the first free trade rally in Western Canada was held in 1849. Uh, a, a Métis trader by the name of Sayer, S-A-Y-E-R, I think it was Guillaume Sayer. He worked for the Northwest Company, he worked for the Bay, but he was one of these independent Westerners, and he, he went down to, to uh, North Dakota, to Pembina, North Dakota, and he bought some goods and came back and started to sell them in the, the Northwest at the time it was controlled by the Hudson Bay. And the Hudson Bay had an absolute monopoly on trade. So he was actually guilty, free trading was a, a crime. So he, he was charged with free trading. And, and, and he was dragged before a magistrate in Assiniboia uh, to be tried for the crime of free trading. But uh, fortunately for him, the, this trial was set for the spring when the Métis buffalo hunters were all in town getting ready to go out on the buffalo hunt with their buffalo guns. And, and it was quite clear to the magistrate that these Métis <laughs> buffalo hunters were on Sayer's side. So he, he technically found him guilty of free trading, but he, he didn't send him to prison and he, and he fined him a dollar or something. And so the, uh, the, the matey thought that they'd won the case and apparently rode around the little courthouse in Assiniboine firing off their uh, buffalo guns and singing, Vive la commerce leave. <laughs> <laughs> this was the first free trade rally in 1849. It's quite a long ways uh, Back, but but come more recently, uh, there, there was this uh, New West uh, partnership. partnership agreement that was negotiated between uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and I think BC. BC is part of it too. That, that was an attempt to knock down some of these internal barriers to trade. Are you, were you familiar with that? Uh, yes, um, it's 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 an attempt at getting around uh, many of these um, barriers through regulation. And, and through and through rules, so that uh, there was is supposed to be uh, opening up for the free movement of labor, the free movement of uh, goods, services, and money. Uh, and so, um, the unfortunate thing, of course, is that it didn't take off, and the rest of the country hasn't hasn't signed up for it. When I when I was in Atlantic Canada, I was trying to encourage some of the governments in Atlantic Canada. Uh, immediately to sign on to it, uh, and so they would. Uh, the four provinces would have an immediate framework in which uh, to start opening up um, that didn't have to be negotiated uh, from uh, from zero. And as I recall, reading that agreement, there, there was an appendix that had about forty exceptions to it. <laughs> to it. it uh, but that doesn't this suggest that ultimately to knock down these internal barriers to trade, the federal government has to become involved and exert its its trade and commerce power more vigorously than it has in the past? Isn't that ultimately what has to happen? I I, I think that there, there are two schools of thought on this one, uh, and uh, and some people think that uh, uh, it would be overreaching and excessive on the part of the federal government. Uh, to do uh, something like that, but the reality is, if if, if we go back and read uh, the the Confederation debates, uh, for example, um, between 1864 and 1867 in in in, uh, in the different houses of Parliament of the of the four colonies, uh, there was a clear desire to have an economic union that there would be uh, less tariffs uh, and less barriers. Uh, to the movement uh, among of themselves, uh, yeah. among yeah. themselves, so yeah. so th what they were creating was an economic union in which goods could move uh, fairly freely, uh, and I think we have not lived up to that part of the bargain from the uh, uh, 1867 BNA Act. Well, that's a that's a fr fruitful area for <laughs> future work, I guess. Uh, I guess one of the other aspirations it comes back to this equality uh, business and uh, the, the desire for greater fairness and equality in, in federal, provincial, financial relations, which includes equalization, but is bigger than equalization. I think the figures for Alberta, you, you might uh, correct me on this, but to, just prior to the COVID uh, um, crisis, which has distorted a lot of federal, provincial, financial transfers, but prior to that, uh, the uh, federal government was collecting, let's say, from Alberta 
in total from corporate income taxes, personal income taxes, all federal levies, about $20 billion mm -hmm. more than it spent in the province of Alberta, of which equalization is a part, but it's, it's a lot bigger than just equalization. And that uh, is very much resented. In Alberta doesn't mind contributing more than its fair share to the economy as a whole, but considers that an, uh, uh, an unfair aspect of the federal provincial financial arrangements. And, and uh, what can be done to get at that? I think by now it's kind of ingrained in the culture uh, that uh, a desire to have uh, what is originally in the spirit of equalization, that provinces should offer uh, a certain level of uh, services to all citizens at a similar level of taxation. Um, but that spirit does not require equalization to be in the form that it is uh, or to unfold with the present formula. Uh, there are many issues with the present formula that, that make it, again, going back to uh, the uh, previous part of the conversation, uh, unequal or yeah. unfair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that certain resources are included uh, in the uh, in the calculation of the of the formula and and others not, and that advantages some provinces and disadvantages other. Uh, non renewable resources like uh, oil and gas, for example, um, are are included in the formula, whereas, for example, hydro uh, hydro energy uh, is not. So these are things that that need to be fixed. Uh, and it is possible to preserve the spirit of wanting to share. And Albertans are generous people. Um, it's not that they don't want to share, it's that there are uh, significant uh, inequalities. And of course, then there is uh, the element of obstruction, um, that uh, um, one province is essentially uh, blocking the greater development of the very natural resource uh, and its exportation. Uh, uh, abroad that's and, and generating the, that is generating uh, the the, the golden the golden eggs yeah. as as it were, yeah. uh, and so I think Albertans uh, in, in in particular I think one could say probably to some extent in Saskatchewan as well uh, there is this certain desire to 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 free uh, the, uh, the, the 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 fiscal shackles uh, in many ways. Do you think there will be an opportunity? As you know, Alberta's just had this uh, referendum on equalization where. Uh, uh, majority and not, not a huge majority, but significant majority. The people that participated in that said, "Yes, we should remove the section of the uh, section 36.2 of the constitution that constitutionalizes equalization payments. It should be removed." And uh, as I understand it, uh, the, the federal government's got some obligation now to negotiate with Alberta over that uh, point. And, and uh, I think the. Premier is calling for a, a federal provincial meeting to discuss it, or he probably will. And at that meeting, uh, while I, I think, uh, I guess Alberta would present the position that the way it's being done now is not equitable, but the question is going to come then what's, what's an alternative approach to that? We would still recognize the spirit of equalization, but not the inequities of the current point. Is, it, is there anything clear as to what that alternative? It is not, but there are alternatives. Um, one of the things, uh, for example, that has been argued ab about or, or in favor of removing equalization is that it also hurts the recipients um, yeah. In, in, yeah. In, in, in the sense that uh, there, there is a less impetus to grow the economy, uh, to grow the budget, the to grow the... side of social welfare on the individual level. Precisely. Uh, and, and has fostered a kind of dependency, which is also a drag, uh, not on, only on the spirits of individuals, but, but on, the, on, on the collective. Uh, and so when you have disincentives to grow your economy, well, you're not going to grow your economy. And uh, I remember reading a paper now um, many, many years ago uh, and uh, that argued, for example, that one way around uh, the, the redistribution that equalization provides would be for the federal government to download the GST income uh, to, to the provinces. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about it in those terms, um, so the GST wouldn't be going to Ottawa. The 5% that we collect uh, would remain uh, in each province. And that means that the have-not provinces or the recipients, I, I like better that term yeah, than, yeah. than have-nots, 
uh, that the, rece the receiving provinces will have now an incentive to grow their economies uh, because the more they grow their economy, then uh, the greater the income uh, into, the, uh, into the provincial coffers. And I don't know that that is the precise answer or, or whether... the kind of things that should be thought of. We may, we maybe end this section on the on equalization with the story that well, this is more amusing than anything else. Uh, as you know, there's a huge literature on equalization now and, and a rationalization of it and the theory behind it. And, and uh, when I was going to university a long time ago, I, I, there was a lecture given by a very learned professor on the intellectual framework called the equalization. And uh, I listened to this. I was very impressed with it. And I went back across the river. My, my father was Premier of Alberta at that time. And I went into his office and said, I now understand equalization. He said, oh, that's good. Tell, tell me how it works. And uh, so I started to repeat this lecture. And he, he started to chuckle. And I said, well, what are you laughing about? Well, he said, I attended the first federal provincial conference. Mackenzie King was still the prime minister after the war when this came up, not under that name, but it was the, the concept. And he said, what happened was that usual, what usually happens at those federal provincial conferences, nothing was decided at the conference. But that night they went out to Kingsmere, to Mackenzie King's residence. This is often where the real negotiating <laughs> goes on and a after much uh, e e eating and drinking with a heavy, my father's a teetotaler, but it was a heavy flow of, <laughs> of liquor. The king got around to basically going around the room and saying, what do you want? And what are you prepared to give up to get it? What do you want in terms of dollars? What do you want out of the federal government in terms of dollars? But what are you prepared to concede to get it? And he went around the room like that. And my father said, I think what happened the next day, king called in his finance minister and the deputy and said, figure out a way to give him this, but to extract that. Figure out a way to give that province this, but demand this in return. And uh, and he probably added the end, find some formula to <laughs> rationalize what we're doing. And, and then my father's point was the, the deal came first and the rationalization of it came second. And, and his point was equalization uh, and its roots had a, had a political deal behind it. And then the formula in that was built on top. And, uh, and his point was, if you're ever going to reform equalization, understanding the, what do they have to have and what might they be persuaded to give up in order to do it by going around the table, that's probably still the fundamental way to come at the reform of equalization. And, and that, by the way, makes me think that it's also one of the aspects of uh, Western culture. Um, the, the West was framed, uh, such as it is today, um, at the tail end of uh, the Victorian era, uh, where people did business on a handshake, and yeah. honor yeah. and one's word meant everything. Yeah. And, and, and then people would go and chase the details, and the lawyers would come in and, and arrange it. Uh, you know this better than I do. People still do business like this in Calgary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the deal precedes the, the legal framework and the rationalization. Yeah. Right? So yeah. what's the deal for the future? Well, we've got, we've got, we, these are all things that we can come back to, you know, in future podcasts. And we can get people in here that are working on each of these Western aspirations that are distinctive and that uh, ways and means have to be designed to satisfy them or there's going to be increasing Western discontent over these things. But maybe I can return to this original concept of the, of the West as a distinctive region, and what has to happen to get that uh, recognized more at the national level? And uh, uh, here's a contemporary story. that We've just gone through a federal election, and prior to the election, there were the number of the Western MPs. Uh, these are particularly conservative MPs, but what I'm talking about would actually apply or is relevant to each of the federal parties who, who felt that the platform of their party did not address this Western alienation, or let's say, positive, did not address these Western aspirations strongly enough. In, in the Conservative Party of Canada's 150 word, 150 page platform, it was three pages addressing some of these things peripherally, but not strongly. So they argued with the with the platform people uh, and. Uh, the leadership that there, this ought to be strengthened. And part of the pushback was, was if, look, if we address Western alienation too strongly, we alienate people in other parts of the country. 
Uh, and that's the problem, addressing the regional distinctives of any region. You make that region happy, but you alienate other people. So out of that came the suggestion, well, why doesn't some federal leader in some federal party, you know, I talk more about the conservatives, but this would apply to any of them. Why doesn't one of them uh, officially declare that it, it will formally recognize the regional character of Canada. It recognizes Atlantic Canada as a region, it recognizes Quebec or the Laurentian region, however you want to divide it up. It recognizes the Prairie region, the Pacific region, the Northern region, and so forth. And it recognizes that they each have distinctive aspirations and concerns. And it is going to have elements in its platform to address each of those. And, and it then makes the point, too, that the price of you in your region getting your distinctive aspirations met is your willingness to cooperate rather than to oppose our efforts to do something for some other region. Isn't that a way to officially recognize this uh, regional character of the country and in a positive way that would be um, uh, beneficial? And apparently at the first Conservative caucus meeting after the election, there, there was some discussion of this, and, and it didn't just come from Western members. Like you, you have a background in Atlantic Canada, wouldn't that doesn't Atlantic Canada have some distinctive aspirations and concerns that that should be addressed and could be addressed in that kind of a framework? Uh, what, what I like about uh, that idea, um, in essence, is that the formal recognition of the distinctiveness of these regions in and of itself is a good thing. Uh, but it would also lift uh, the near compulsion among uh, federal politicians uh, to have to uh, fib or to have to maintain, you know, three or four different discourses during the same federal campaign uh, so that you know, they, they whisper one thing in Quebec and then they whisper something else in Atlantic Canada, uh, which seems not just across purposes, but it gives them this aura of disingenuity. Yeah. Uh, whereas yeah. if, if we actually came out and said, These, this is a region, this is a region, this is a region, and these regions have uh, inherent needs that must be addressed, then it would make it, I think, in many ways, more open and more yeah. honest. Yeah. And then the distinctive, like in that framework, addressing Western aspirations doesn't stick out like a sore thumb, mm -hmm. or addressing even Quebec's distinctiveness doesn't stick out like a sore thumb, but under the current arrangement, if you do. It, 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 we're, and this current conception, if you address anybody's, well, it sticks out like a sore thumb right. and it causes you more uh, uh, political problems. Th this formula would also apply to the uh, ur urban, in, in each of those regions, there's an urban rural divide that you should almost recognize in the same way. Like you, you should say to urban people, look, these rural people have certain aspirations and concerns. They're fundamentally different. That Their attitude to everything from guns to law and order is fundamentally different from you. It's not illegitimate. But, but it's it's different. So we're going to address that for them, and we're going to address, you've got some concerns that are fundamentally different. Well, wouldn't this also apply to maybe some way of bridging the urban-rural divide, which is becoming increasingly worrisome in, in all of these regions? In all the regions. In, in tiny little provinces like Nova Scotia and PEI, there are significant urban and rural divides. And you, 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 you don't think of it that way, right? But, but, but it does. And uh, we need to get past this notion um, that is almost inherent to states uh, that is uh, homogenizing legislation and homogenizing regulations, right? Uh, that if we do recognize the distinctiveness of these areas, and if we do recognize that living in, um, in urban centers is a completely different experience than living outside urban centers, yeah. that this requires a certain amount uh, of... Uh, well, there are, say, distinctiveness in the way in which we deal with these rules. Well, I, I think we, should, we try to make the case that there is a regional, uh, an enormously important regional dimension to Canada, and officially recognizing it and addressing the, uh, the uh, particular regional aspirations and concerns of each region would be beneficial, not just to that region, but to the country as a whole. Well, in, in wrapping this up, uh, Marco, uh, coming back to the political actions that are necessary, the political options that are uh, available for gaining greater recognition of the distinctive character, particularly of Western Canada, and, and not just getting recognition, but getting action on these aspirations that are so key to uh, 
the, the West, what, what do you see as the, the major political options for addressing this uh, regional discontent, or let's put it positively, regional aspiration? Uh, yes, I, I, I think that's, that's true. Uh, there, there is a sense in which um, there, there is a certain anxiety, perhaps, or a certain sentiment in the West uh, that the current arrangement has uh, run its course, in a sense, that, that the status quo is not it, it's, it's not tenable anymore. Uh, and there are uh, probably a, a good variety of different uh, proposals and answers. And but but I think there are three main lines. Uh, one is uh, is to to look at what we have and find ways to uh, tinker and address uh, some of these issues, uh, maybe. Frontally, maybe on the on the periphery, but keep working through but the to keep system and hoping you can persuade some federal government, some other provinces to, to yes, be more and, supportive of these kind of measures. Yeah, and 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 there is some level of sympathy, I think, in in other parts of the country for for what uh, those solutions might be. Um, at the other end, uh, of course, maybe extreme, uh, there is this push and desire uh, to uh, to break away. Uh, essentially, to have to a full secession, to have a a, a sovereign Western Canada, uh, a, a sovereign Alberta and Saskatchewan. There, there are different colors and variations of that one, but essentially, is extracted uh, from the uh, from the federation. Is it a real option, or just as a threat to try to get action? Because, in a way, for it to be a threat, it has to have some substance to it. Yes, because uh, you know when you're playing poker, if uh, if if your counterpart knows that you're bluffing, uh, then that that, that that's that's kind of out the window. Uh, so, the, and, and some people are very aware of this that that they need to mean it in order to make it effective. Uh, and then uh, there is this newish, I suppose, proposal. Uh, of uh, trying to mirror somewhat uh, the uh, the idea that uh, came out uh, out of Quebec of a certain kind of sovereignty association, uh, where uh, the West, like the proposal for uh, for Quebec, would occupy uh, the fullness of its constitutional space. Um, nothing unlawful. Uh, nothing. But you uh, have a Western police force. You have a Western Canada pension plan. You have a Western. Uh, you you collect all the taxes. That you basically establish sovereignty within the country. But uh, but but it it doesn't involve tearing the country apart of the at, at the seams. Uh, simply, uh, it involves bolstering uh, the jurisdictional sovereignty of the provinces in areas that the constitutional. Uh, the constitutional framework grants them. In, in future, we want to get into great, greater depth uh, on expanding basically this Western story. There's a, there's a historic heritage aspect to the Western story, but there's a, a current Western story, and it's the future chapters for the West that we eventually want to get on to. So I want to thank you for joining us. Thank the Thanks very much. have watched this uh, uh, podcast. We'd like to he hear from you and... Uh, uh, basically, if you're interested in these Western stories, not just the past, but the present and the future, uh, can you please visit our website, uh, uh, let us know who you are, and uh, join us next time around.